going on everyone? My name is Mark and welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel for the first time. Now, I know this is the first video that I have posted in about three months, so for my current subscribers, I sincerely thank you for your undying patience. Sometimes things happen in life that impede our progress, so I certainly appreciate all of you being understanding of that. When we last convened, I spoke of the next five helmets that I plan to make in the order that I intended to make them. And as promised, today you will finally get to see me put together Shredder's helmet from the 1990 film Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Just like in all of my other videos, I have annotated all of the resources and materials that were used, such as the model that I selected for this video. Today's model comes from Charlie Clark on cgtrader.com forward slash Grizzly Mountain Designs, or check out his Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Grizzly Mountain Designs. What I liked most about this model was the high level of accuracy that this designer was able to achieve in comparison to the screen used helmet. This also happens to be the most accurate model that I could find on the internet. And since I'm making this helmet for a friend that has a deep appreciation for this character, I certainly did not want to disappoint him. If you're interested in the music selection for this video, I have annotated below the link from which that audio originated. Notably, those tracks are copyright free, so if you have a TMNT related project that you're currently working on, you may find it beneficial to check those out. Now, before we jump into post-processing, I wanted to also make note of the fact that this is the first video that I have published where my 3D prints were recorded in print lapse as opposed to time lapse. For those who aren't familiar with the former or latter terms, a time lapse is where a picture is taken at a set time interval, whereas a print lapse is achieved by taking a picture in between print layers. Up to this point, I haven't been satisfied with the quality of my videos in general, and I hope that this change is seen as a major improvement by most of you. Of course, there are other certain fundamental changes that will be made in future videos, but hopefully this will be viewed as a positive change. Also, if anyone is interested, I would be more than happy to make a standalone video outlining my process for how I achieve the print lapse effect. So for any of my fellow comrades in the 3D printing community, or anyone else for that matter, let me know in the comment section if you want to see a video that is dedicated to making a print lapse, or rather, notably also referred to as a layer lapse video. And if you've made it this far into the video, first I would like to say thank you, but also be sure to hit the notification bell if you don't want to miss any of my upcoming videos as you will be notified when I publish new content. To kick things off, I'm certain that one of the things that you may have noticed was that a few of my prints did not finish as originally intended. There were instances where the hot end of my printer stopped extruding and I had to basically start the print as close to where it last left off rather than completely starting the print over again. To briefly explain what was causing this, filament printers have to retract filament from the nozzle or referred to as the hot end. Otherwise, oozing will occur out of the nozzle. If the retraction distance is too high, it can cause filament breakage at the extruder end, which is precisely what was happening. Unfortunately, this was not something that was corrected until well after this model was printed. The positive aspect to these print fails is that I get to educate my audience on how to salvage failed prints such as these which is what I intend to do. Now, just like in any of my other videos, I began smoothing my prints with 80 grit sandpaper, and for something with as much texture as this, I was careful not to over sand as I didn't want to sand away any major details. As for the crown section, which was unfortunately broken up into four parts, this was carefully adhered together with five minute epoxy as opposed to the dome section that was adhered together with super glue as shown earlier. For all parts that were glued together, the adjoining ends were lightly scuffed with the same 80 grit sandpaper. Although you don't have to necessarily follow this next recommendation, I will typically allow 5 minute epoxy to cure for a full 24 hours before handling. 
I have found that depending on the environment, this adhesive can sometimes not fully cure within the time frame that is described on the packaging. Sometimes it is best just to clamp together your separate parts and allow them to set up. When 3D printed models are adhered together in this way, there will always be inconsistencies, seams that will have to be compensated for. Later on, I'll show how to cover up major seams like the ones shown on the right side of the crown. Mostly, what that is going to entail is repeated sanding in tandem with gap filling using Bondo and glazing spot putty. As for the rest of the dome, the four individual sections were tacked together temporarily with the same super glue from earlier. Then to speed up the curing process, a super glue accelerator was applied. Of course, to hold together something as large as this, super glue is far too brittle. And after prolonged use, I anticipate that there would be failure along one of the seams. Therefore, I decided to employ a technique that I used in a previous video, which was to break out my plastic welder. This tool is one that I first discovered when watching a video on plastic car bumper cover repair. The way that it works is that it heats up metal staples until they're hot enough to melt through plastic. Once the staple is covered underneath of a melted layer of plastic, the trigger can be released allowing the hot staple to cool down, leaving it permanently embedded inside of the plastic model. By this point in recording, I had jumped the gun a little bit on spraying the top of the dome with a sandable primer prior to hot stapling everything together, but methodically speaking, sandable primer after 80 grit sanding would be the next step, followed by 320 grit sanding. In order to make this helmet wearable, I had to establish some sort of anchor point where an adjustable strap could be mounted. Very similar to how I set up my harnesses in my Hylian Shield video, I decided to go with a plastic wall anchor that I mounted on the front center section of the helmet. Logically, this was the only space where the wall anchor could fit anyway, and secondly, this is the same place where the crown will be later mounted. And just like before, plenty of 5 minute epoxy was used for adhesion, because what better material could we use to bond plastic with more plastic? Later on, you'll get to see this headband get installed again, but with additional padding, and I'll go into detail on where you can find one of these adjustable headbands. The current install that you're watching was purely for a test fitting, and was removed before painting. Let's go ahead and switch gears for a moment and work on the crown and mask, both of which needed major work in terms of gap filling and slight reshaping. For areas that need reshaping or have major gaps, Bondo is the best choice for the job. Glazing Spot Putty has almost the same consistency as toothpaste and is best used on more shallow gaps in craters. Both, however, are carcinogenic so be sure to wear proper breathing protection when applying and sanding. Also, ensure that you are wearing nitrile gloves to avoid skin contact. For best results when sanding Bondo, I'll typically start with 80 grit sandpaper and I'll follow up with 320 grit. For areas with just spot putty, you can start with 320 grit. Once your model is resprayed with a sandable primer, all of the remaining imperfections seem to magically reappear. From this point forward, you can literally repeat this process indefinitely until you're happy with your model. If I'm not mistaken, I've pretty much said the same thing in almost all of my videos, minus the one where I painted two different Boba Fett helmets. But that's the real magic, isn't it? Taking an imperfect 3D print and smoothing it until anyone else looking at it wouldn't even guess that it was 3D printed. Of course, that is all relative to the person working on it, what model they're working on, and what kind of look they're trying to achieve. Normally, I would leave behind little nicks and dents and throw up some air quotes calling it battle damage. However, this was for a friend that has a deep appreciation for this character, and I wanted to put in the extra work to make this helmet come out as perfect as I possibly could make it. I know the video doesn't show it, but I actually resprayed four or five times. One issue that I had with the mask post-print was removing the support material without damaging the mesh. This model didn't come with a separate STL for the mesh, so I went with a model that was very similar. 
The link for the mesh that I used is included in the description below. Installation was fairly simple. After cutting the mesh material to the appropriate shapes, I applied super glue and sped up the curing time with a super glue accelerator. The next step that I took in finishing the mask and crown was sanding with 600 grit sandpaper. As both of these items are sanded, you'll notice that the surfaces of both parts become reflective, even with just the primer coat. The more reflective the base coat is, the more reflective the metallic finish layer will be later on. Equally, I could have accomplished the same effect by spraying these with gloss black spray paint beforehand. Also, even though the footage doesn't show it, both of these parts were sanded back down and resprayed several times until I was happy with the finish, and then later on sprayed with a high gloss clear coat. The link for the clear coat that I used is in the description below. For the dome, the base coat that I went with was Rustoleum Espresso, which was actually left over from a previous project. Of course, I wanted this to be a tad bit darker, so I mixed up some brown and black acrylic paint and I diluted it with a little bit of water. Then with a paintbrush, I applied my mixture liberally and allowed it to dry. Once the acrylic wash was dry, I went ahead and sealed that up with a satin clear coat, which at this point wasn't exactly necessary, but also it didn't hurt anything either to apply it. You may notice that the brown is inconsistent between dark and light, which is what I was going for. This next step is one that was undoubtedly the most tedious and time consuming. The netted texture on the outside of the helmet was painted using a detail brush, which took roughly 16 hours consistently. I remember starting this process at 3 in the afternoon and didn't finish until 7 a.m. the next morning. The reason why it took so long was simply that the netting was pretty intricate, and to paint this cleanly, I had to take my time. And of course, the enamel that I decided to go with was Tester's Brass Enamel. This enamel is also great for airbrushing, and in some of the coming videos, you'll get to see me use this exact enamel in an airbrush. As much as I like how vibrant the metallic enamel came out, the reference material suggests that the finish is quite the opposite. Therefore, I pulled out the same acrylic mixture from earlier and gave the helmet another dirt wash. Also, just like before, I sprayed the helmet with a satin finish clear coat to protect the two previous layers of paint. So the adjustable headband is a replacement headband that is intended for a welder's mask. With some slight modification, I was able to make this fit into this helmet pretty easily. Although you can find them for a decent price online, I picked mine up at a tractor supply. Before installing the crown, I had to accommodate for the additional space needed due to the wall anchor sticking out of the front of the helmet. I was able to wallow out the pre-existing hole with a spade bit. Just be careful not to drill through your model like I did. The crown was adhered with 5 minute epoxy after some light scuffing with 80 grit sandpaper along the contact points was performed. Aside from some additional padding inside of the mask that was added later, that pretty much wraps up this video. So, if you enjoyed this content, go ahead and give me all the love and praise that you think I deserve, and I hope you'll join me next time. Thanks for watching.